Um, do we have any new people here tonight? Excellent. So, welcome, welcome along. We've got the toilets just down the uh, alley there. Um, you'll find them. Um, we have a Google group for emails. So, if you come and see Les at the end and have your email added to that whenever we do events or um, ask questions of the EV group here, then you get to see that. Um, there's also, we're on Facebook as well, so check that out. Um, we've got some merchandise as well. Uh, shirts, hats, pens, and EV signs. Um, if you want a shirt, there are only a limited range of sizes here, but if Simone said we can, you can actually order them if you want to, uh, your size in particular. Um, and where's the money tin? So if it's your first time, it's free. If you're here for uh, more than your first time, it's $3 if you're not a member, $2 if you're a member. Um, thank you, Liz. All right, so same format as I did last month. We're going to go through um, latest infrastructure, go through the latest EVs, uh, future uh, events that we've just had, and then um, future events. Uh, so just recently, they opened up another Eureka. <laughs> Keep up, Liz. Come on, mate. So um, here it is. I mean. You might be familiar with the Eureka sites already. So this is down at Helen's Vale now. So reasonably helpful if you're trying to get down to the Gold Coast and you don't have that range. Yep. Um, so here is the Pacific Motorway. And then you just turn off, come in towards the train station. And up here is where the charger is. There's a um, coffee shop just there. And that's like the Westfield. Uh, this is the probably reasonably well known now that I've mentioned it so many times. Uh, the Coochin Creek EV charger that went live on the 12th of November. Um, thank you for all those people who saw me on the news and made a comment. Uh, but basically, this is the first one of this brand's charger. It's at the furthest most point, or there's they're going to put one in at Gympie, and then, uh, but they've chosen this glasshouse one, and then they're doing a big loop down. So uh, this is the first one they could secure the site for and had the, everything lined up for the, this opening. And uh, next one is um, just the, uh, the minister with the, the CEO and the, the money man, Trevor. So that was... Um, last Tuesday. What day is it today? It's Wednesday. Last Tuesday. And uh, that was a good day. It was quite, quite well attended. And um, um, I've been there several times now and everything seems to work fine. I will be doing a video about the app, using the app and using the RFID card. Um, keep an eye out for those. Uh, so in the last month since the previous uh, meeting. They've charge Fox and EV have both released where they're putting all of their 350 kilowatt charges um, in Australia. So I'm just concentrating this this presentation on the not not on the Western Australia ones, but just on the Eastern Seaboard here. But um, pretty self-explanatory. You can see there uh, they've actually built one in Sydney now. Um, so that's their sixth one for Charge Fox. Next one, Les. And this is the EV one. Um, as you can see, there's, they've got the north of Queensland covered too. Uh, obviously, we've got the electric superhighway in there, bridging that gap with the 50 kilowatts. Um, but th this one here is where they built the one at Glasshouse Mountains. They're eventually building one at Gympie, uh, Yatla, and Tweed. The locally and it switch in Toowoomba. But just for this presentation, what I thought I'd do is actually um, off here, put them together and just show you like the range between the charges that is going to be available in a year or 18 months time. So 
these, these, this is the, probably the more important part here. And uh, you can pretty much going to be able to drive from Gympie, well, to Port Macquarie if you've only got 100 kilometres range. But anyone who's got 150 kilometres range should be, able, should be able to drive down to Sydney without much hassle other than having to charge and charge and charge and charge if you've got that low range. But um, at the moment, we've only really got Coochin Creek, Turnbull, Hamilton, Helen's Vale's just opened. We've got the one at Coolangatta, Byron Bay, Grafton, Nabiac, Walls End, and Sydney. So there is quite a lot to go in there still, and that uh, bridges a lot of those wider gaps there. So as you can see, um, I tried to make it slightly transparent, but you can see there's like quite a lot of dots on that map when there's not much of a gap. So. In a year's time, that will be actually pretty good if you want to drive to Sydney. And I feel like the driving north will be a similar situation after a while as well. Uh, latest EV availability. We'll just flip through this quickly because uh, not too much has changed. But for those that are first timers, Nissan Leaf came out in August. 38 kilowatt hour usable battery. 230 to 270 kilometre range with um, $54,000 price tag. Uh, we've got the Tesla Model 3, comes in standard range plus, comes with long range and performance as well, ranging from 71,000 to 110,000. Um, the standard range plus has 50 kilowatt usable, 350 to 400 kilometres range. The long range and performance have a 74 kilowatt hour usable. I don't know about these two numbers, it seems a bit too close, but um, 500 to 600 kilometres range now. And if you think back onto that previous chart, like you're going to be able to do one or two stops to get to Sydney, no problem, really. And uh, I went down to Sydney for the EV Expo and I had to put a little bit of planning in, but uh, as more and more EVs come out like this, there just won't be really any requirement to do much planning because when it's every 50 kilometres away, you just once you're at 100 kilometres, then you charge, don't you? So that should be pretty good. Um, this was at the Sydney EV Expo. It was the uh, new Ionic 38 kilowatt hour. Uh, the previous Ionic was 28 kilowatt hour. Um, once again, Hyundai give the usable amount, so I'm not really sure what the actual is. Probably 40, 41, something like that. 280 to 320, a bit more than the Leaf because the Ionics are a bit more efficient. Um, and the price tag just slightly cheaper than the Leaf at 52,000. Uh, these, the, these were on show at the Sydney EV Expo, the, the Glory E3 and the EC35, I think it is. I can't really read the number plate. I think it's 35 or 25. Um, I think they're going to be priced approximately, don't quote me on this, but I think they're going to be priced around about the fifty to sixty thousand dollar mark. We're going to have about three hundred and fifty to four hundred kilometers range. That's what they're quoting. Uh, the battery is a bit smaller than the Kona, so I only compare on what I know. So, but I sat in it and the. Um, this was on the Friday before the event, and the guy was a lovely guy, came and gave me a rundown and let me sit in it. This is, it's essentially still in prototype stage. They haven't set all the different parameters that they're gonna put in the car. I had a good look around it. Um, some of the menus are still in Chinese and stuff like that. Um, but essentially, it, was, it actually looked pretty good. It didn't look, it didn't feel cheap. It didn't, um, you, you didn't, balk at anything so that might be um, a good option when it comes to the market but once again it's an unknown brand so you know risk and reward <laughs> all right recent events um sydney ev expo uh advantage uh so um i enjoyed myself it was uh Probably a little less, uh, a few less people went than was maybe expected, but that precinct was very busy. 
and there was other home show things on and and uh, there was a lot of people around but um, <laughs> um, this was on the first day just lining up some of the cars <laughs> what are you doing Graham? <laughs> just the door okay this was the um, these are just some of the slides I've taken from the actual um, expo. There was a, a fair bit going on and I didn't want to go on about this for at least an hour, but um, this was a 1974 Enfield 8000 and uh, the note on it actually said one of only 20 believed to still remain in the world. So uh, owned by, I'm pretty sure that was, is that Gary? Greg, Greg Partridge, the previous president of the AEBA. <laughs> doesn't surprise me <laughs> one for parts but uh, yeah this is uh, I believe Michael Day's Lotus and um, can't really see it but the back is missing so it's a project at the moment but that was a nice looking thing as well and uh, very unusual this car as well the um, the Honda Insight hybrid which um, was from 2001 I believe and very rare, well, according to the, the fellow who was telling me, very rare, um, only about 10 or something in Australia, but uh, had a bit of a look around that, and uh, I think there's a sheet, yeah, I don't know how well you can see this, but um, best range, 1,000 kilometres, so that's um, quite good with a, look, it's a 6.5 kilowatt hour battery, but I think, I spoke to someone with the, the Holden, is it the Bolt or the Volt here? The Volt. And they say what they, they actually changed the hybrid, the actual um, ice motor to be um, a lot more efficient when they have a hybrid. It's not just normal. You guys might not know a bit more about it than me, but um, they, they do it so the range can be so much further than just regular. So I found that pretty interesting. Um, this, yeah, 2001, 850 kilos. Has anyone seen one of those before? You have? Bright red. Yeah, I haven't seen one. These are just some stills from uh, video I was taking, but essentially they had, this, this was quite a good part of the EV Expo. They had like um, this sort of marshalling area where cars would just come in take people for drives, go around, do a loop, and then come back, drop them off, take more people. So uh, I did that myself, did about 20 test rides with people. So they just had a line of people here. Um, and, uh, but some people, but you'd pull up and people were lining up to go, go in the Model 3 by themselves. So that was an option. They could drive, someone had put their Model 3 up for abuse. So um, no, that was good. Um, so you kind of had the, the marshalling area here and it had a long strip here where um, people could ride the, so just on this side, on this wall over here, you had a long um, strip where people could ride mountain bikes and, um, and the e-motions stuff and uh, what else, these scooters, so that was, that was pretty popular as well. And yeah, there you can see there was quite a lot of range of um, converted EVs and then sort of in this area it was more the the charging companies and the manufacturers Hyundai and Nissan and the Glory E3 stuff so and the Glen George uh, perpetual trophy that was won by Glen George <laughs> so he drove down from uh, outside Mackay with uh, Trev who some of you might know and uh, yeah he got that Actually, uh, if anyone's interested, I did the E, I did a, and Graham interviewed him uh, just about some of his time, you know, in yesteryear about how he got into EV. So I put that on the AVA uh, YouTube channel if you guys want to check that out. All right, that was the Sydney EV Expo. Did um, Graham or Simone want to say anything about the oh, Sydney stuff? That when George voted that he had the life yes, so he got voted the life membership, yeah. And um, did, do you want to add anything about the, the actual event itself? No, not really. 
the, yeah, it, it was fun. Like there was heaps to do. I, sometimes you find yourself talking to too many people and not actually doing enough stuff. And uh, well, I do because I'm a chatterbox. But um, yeah, no, it's it's really good. This was uh, something that I saw online was the renewable energy pop up that ended up being in uh, King George Square last Thursday, and uh, Gary and I went to that. Um, I had uh, someone from one of the Tesla owners was nice enough to um, pick me up in this Tesla here, and because uh, they they had most of the other manufacturers, but they didn't have a Tesla and um, they didn't have the BMW, so I suggested to them that I could organise that, and they were happy with that. And we did the AVA stand just there, we got the Motion stuff there, Jaguar. Um, they were like just giving away free plants just here. Um, there was another marquee that was all about. Uh, solar panels and inverters and sustainable stuff like that so was there, was there another photo there no, no, no. <laughs> should have been another there was Nissan two Nissan Leafs uh, the new Hyundai uh, Ionic and a Kona there as well um, okay upcoming events you want to speak about the electric car of the year award Hello, Simone. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I thought you might be talking about me. <laughs> oh, I know, we're at the top of the list. Yeah. Okay. Just that. Just that. Yeah. The rest I don't talk about. No, just, just the, yeah. So electric car of the... Mm, Muppet. For the camera. Oh, for the camera. Hi, camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so electric car of the year award. Um, We've been working hard to get some cars to be test driven on this Sunday. We probably won't have all the current available cars this week. We will run another judging day. Um, it's really just a judging day and a day where we go to Cars and Coffee at Surame and show the cars off to people who have an interest in cars because they'll probably have some nice cars there themselves. Um, and then each judge will take the car for a drive for a 30 minute stint, come back, fill in a questionnaire form with some points that they have to give for a, a, quite a few sections and then they hand that in. Now that won't be collated, collated on the day, um, however I do need some people to help me. Um, I probably need a small handful of people, you know, put on a, a nice sexy vest with the fluoro on and just help make sure that people don't get run over basically, that's what it comes down to, maybe hand out cards and whatever on the day. Um, that yeah, that's this Sunday. There Anyone will be crickets. I can hear crickets. <laughs> anyway, you can come and see me after if you don't want to make a fool of yourself. That's fine. Um, I really only need. I probably only need maybe two, two or three people. I imagine um, there may be an opportunity for somebody to also do a test drive. Still, I know it's almost Sunday now, but. There's been so much to organise in the last two weeks, it's been a bit crazy. So there will be another opportunity probably in the next uh, two or three weeks of doing another one of these days. So it's really more, it's, no, it's not like a big function or a big expo. It's really just getting bums in cars, doing a set circuit for those judges to judge that car for that circuit. And then once we tally it up, we will actually have a presentation night early next year. Um, and then present the trophy at that time. So there is still time to do test drives. Um, but we are asking dealers or manufacturers to provide the cars rather than members, because I felt, or we, we felt that it was important for them to be aware that we're doing something to help them sell cars, basically, because we're eager to get cars out there. So that's really it. Any questions? It came, with, it came through um, Rob. Yeah, so Rob um, was the one that actually made that suggestion a number of months ago um, and he's been working a little bit in the background as well. So there's a couple of us working on it. Um, and so, look, some dealers and manufacturers are like, yep, we'll be there, no problem. And others are more hesitant. And maybe it has to do with the fact that some of the other cars are worth $150,000 rather than just a $60,000 car, I don't know. Um, Hyundai were there straight away and this and are definitely booked in. Um, our friend who is, you know, who came to our drive day with the iPACE 
Uh, that dealership is, is eager, so they're there. So they're the ones that are definitely there for Sunday. Still working on Renault and Audi. Yes. So what we're doing is we're starting off at Tridium. We're driving over to Siramay Winery um, as a, for a cu the cars and coffee. So we'll have a coffee, have a bit of breakfast, talk about the cars, look them over, you know, all that sort of stuff. Brief the drivers, of course, um, further than what they've been briefed already, and then just go from there and do a circuit. And then in the afternoon, just drive back to Tridium and park the cars again. So yeah, it's not a hard day. Um, you know, I imagine we'd probably meet whoever is volunteering at Cirame. Um, I'd be happy to even shout a coffee, have a little bit of breakfast. If that gets you there, no problem. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Well, thanks. <laughs> All right, um, just some of the other upcoming stuff is uh, there's a Toka um, event on the 1st of December. They're driving from the Gap out through Northbrook Parkway down the side of Somerset and finishing down in Fernvale. Uh, for those of you that aren't members of the Toka group, that's like $10 to join. So. Um, might, might be, they're doing some stuff along the day, so it's quite a day out. Um, I had planned to do a Tritium tour in December with um, a rally, but um, Tritium have said that they're actually uh, quite busy with the, with, in production at the moment and there aren't any tours to be done in December. So I'm going to keep pushing uh, to have that beginning of next year. and. Um, I was, gonna, I was looking at the Mount Cotton um, driver training thing, but uh, if you want to do that for one day, it's actually like $240 or something like that. It's quite expensive, and I just thought, well, it's a nice idea, but uh, I might come up with some other plan. So what I'm actually going to probably do is uh, organise a rally where you get like 100 questions or something, and you have to go around and... Um, answer the questions and we'll end up at all together at, the, at one point that won't be known at the beginning and then we'll have lunch at that place. So if you are interested in that, we'll, well, I'll organise that for the new year. Uh, might be worth coming along to that for a bit of fun. Um, we had the um, committee meeting two, three weeks ago and we came up with uh, Karagara Island, that autonomous uh, bus if anyone wants to go and check that out. We'll go and check that out maybe in February. Um, I'll... John, that starts Wednesday. What's that? It starts on Wednesday? Yeah, well... <laughs> Why does an autonomous bus need a driver? Because they're not allowed to be autonomous. Oh, don't ruin it for everyone, mate. <laughs> Alright. She just stands there with the microphone. Oh. Interesting. All right. Um, Byron Bay will be a bit longer of a cruise, say 200 kilometres each way for people who want to come on that one. And we'll, that'll be around approximately April. And Drive Electric Week is uh, probably, we're going to form a subcommittee for that. Uh, and that's in the last week of September in 2020. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> All right. It is on the meeting thing, so let's go. Uh, so just as a as a um, an association, I was just hoping that uh, we maybe we could share some of the load of only really um, small tasks like looking after the ordering of uh, merchandise for people, maybe helping out with um, who's on the membership list. Uh, anyone good with spreadsheets wouldn't mind putting their hand up just to, just to yeah. I, th I think you did reply already, didn't you? Yeah, so that was, that was great. But just um, when I was having the, a chat in the committee meeting, it, it seems that like there are 30 different things that need to be done and some of those ones are actually really small that we just take the pressure off the people who are doing all the main work um, and then they can just 
be, you know, delegated to other people just to help out. So um, I might just ask for a little bit of help. If you're interested, come and see us after, and um, it won't be anything difficult. It's just to one hour of someone's time over a month is helpful to someone who's already trying to do 20 hours worth of work. Um, and yeah, we'll discuss that formation of sub subcommittee. Okay. But well, uh, speak to Simone, myself, or Gary if you're interested in uh, putting your hand up for that. But um, that's going to be like the best part of a year away, so plenty of time to sort out who needs to help with what. So, all right, project updates. Every month, I'm going to say this, if people want to stand up and give us a, an update on their projects. We've got one here tonight, so I know there's going to be at least one. <laughs> you want to come up and have a chat about it? I can't tell you much of what I've already done for Guy and Helen's file, and he cost me um, 50 bucks short of 20 grand. Yeah. Yeah. So I cost him 20 grand. But you've modified it already. Yes, I've got a full size wheel in the back for the spare. <laughs> I've done one of these apologies for spare. <laughs> and he fits. Okay. All right. That's, that's about it. That's it. I haven't done anything else. So 50 bucks less than 20 grand, was it? And is it a 24 kilowatt hour battery? I haven't a clue. Oh my god. <laughs> What does what does the range say? What could possibly go wrong, mate? 160. Okay. All right. Excellent. Anyone else? They can't sit on top of the battery? Yeah, I'm here. It's all done. The 
then we do the upgrade and go Hugh Thompson's old and Perhaps some photos for some of the next meetings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or an invite to your workshop and we'll all have a look. Yeah, well, does, does, is everyone interested in that? Because I heard uh, the attendance for this, uh, the December one, because it's sort of middle to late December, ends up being a bit down. So I was actually going to suggest the Breakfast Creek Hotel. Um, we just have an actual sort of social gathering rather than a formal sort of meeting like this. But do you want to meet at the uh, at Gary? Do you want to meet at Gary's workshop? Ah, uh, Graham's <laughs> Graham's workshop. How many people don't mind going down to Springwood for sep for December? <laughs> Graham, you didn't even have your hand up. All right. Oh yeah. Very well done. Yeah. Graham won the MTAQ Award for Innovation. Uh, I don't know that much about it. Maybe Graham can tell you all about it. But yeah. <laughs> You didn't use it very often, from what I can <laughs> So yes, very well done, very well done on that one. All right, um, moving on to our guest speaker, Wolfgang, who is with eMotion Concepts. And welcome, Wolfgang. I just run you through sort of what um, Emotion Concepts is about, where we come from, what we want to do, and where we think our electric vehicles will make a difference. Um, this presentation is sort of our sort of corporate presentation, and through some things I will run a bit quicker, um, just knowing you know that it's late and so forth. So anyway, um, I'm I'm the founder of Emotion Concepts. I founded Emotion Concepts about four years ago sort of on the side of the things I was doing. Um, um, and over the last 18 months, we have really uh, taken on and moved forward uh, in bringing new and, and very exciting electric vehicles, um, all in the low speed category. Um, and um, one of the things we didn't want to do is just do what everyone else does, you know, just put an electric engine into a vehicle. We wanted to be a little bit different. And uh, there's a theme through a lot of these things, which is uh, we prefer three wheels rather than two. Um, and uh, in electric vehicles, that makes quite a bit of sense. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So yeah, that doesn't happen. OK. Oh, it does. OK. Um, look, um, so we are a young company, at least young at heart. I know uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know it. But um, usually at this point, you know, there's always these mission, vision statements, and we thought we'd do it a little bit different, and we're saying who we are, and rather than having a mission, we have an objective, and so forth. But I think the most important thing for us is actually that we um, promise that we will have fun doing what we're going to do. And uh, I think that's the most important part for us. And maybe we can make some money on the way as well. Um, so um, one of our ambitions actually is to look at electric vehicles, not in isolation, but actually look at them in terms of the whole ecosystem as well. And um, one of the things we're looking there is what, what are we going to do with the batteries when we can't use them anymore? So we want to look at a circular economy and repurpose those batteries. And um, they're certainly uh, starting to, being, uh, 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 industry is being developed around this as well, where uh, the batteries out of the EVs turn into uh, storage batteries for, for solar installations and, and other things. Um, 
So, um, look, one of the, uh, a lot of these things which we want to try to do with the smaller vehicles is basically target the energy efficiency, reduce the costs. Local emissions are very important to us. Um, in Australia, there is actually more deaths attributed to uh, pollution than there are actually to uh, car accidents. Almost 40% more deaths are actually contributed to pollution. So this is the local emissions, and that's really one of the things, you know, in the cities these days, we're getting more and more traffic, we're getting more and more trucks going in and out. So the local emissions, even if you don't believe, even if you don't believe in, in global warming and that CO2 has anything to do to it, then really the local emissions are killers which we deal with. And if you have seen the, the skies in the last few days with the pollution from the uh, fires, that's what it's like in, in China every day. You can go to China and don't see the sun for a whole week. Um, the other thing too is, is uh, we are looking at these things about urban congestion as well as, as the limiting car park space and so forth and looking more for actually making livable cities. That's sort of the ambitions we have. Now, we all think, you know, this whole thing, and you guys know that more than anyone else, with the electric vehicles, you know, being formed, I think, in, what, 73? Or something like that? So, so you guys certainly have it up on a lot of other people. On the left-hand side, I found this uh, children's book from 1992 about transportation uh, in the future. And everything we're talking today about, about autonomous vehicles, you know, was in this children's book. And there's a really good section about what the uh, uh, pollution is like and that we have to go to more renewable energies. So, moving forward to, uh, to 2019, more and more uh, companies like Oricon and so forth, they are these, these um, um, consulting companies, they know everything and so forth, and they're saying now that we all have to go electric, we have to have smaller vehicles, uh, E-commerce has increased, uh, the letters amount for Australia Post has been reduced by 70%, replaced by small packages because everyone wants the latest iPhone um, and wants to have it delivered not, not tomorrow, no, we want to have it within an hour. So all these things are drivers now for this uh, new style of economy. Um, last mile transport, you know, we, we're seeing now also that we're getting flexible delivery option, uh, options and, and everything has been more modernized. Um, the flexible delivery options together with automation and, and data, this is where a lot of these things move now. And for us, the flexible delivery networks is where we are heading with our, with our um, vehicles. So, we have got a company called Emotion Concepts, uh, which really works on urban transport solutions. And we have a portfolio of some three-wheelers which uh, look after the transport of goods as well as people. And more recently, we have got into the more personal transport devices. Um, and the reason there is really that the, um, the sales in, in the transport areas, uh, they are really targeted at fleets. And the sales cycle to get them done uh, is a lot longer because you have to convince a lot more layers within the companies. So we had to find something else um, to make some money while we are trying to get the big boys on board. And that's basically in the more personal mobility area. And again, we looked, we looked around and we tried to find something which is a um, bit more interesting but also safer. And most importantly, we believe very strongly that any of these electric small vehicles has to have battery swap, uh, because in commercial world particularly, you can't put a, put a vehicle six, seven hours on a charger. You know, it has to be there and has to be available immediately. Um, so we've got in the urban transport solution side, three vehicles. One is the CT Cargo, which you see here. Then we have the CT Cube, which is basically the, the little brother of the CT Cargo. Um, has some minor differences in terms of size, but also in the, in the drivetrain. And on the right-hand side, we have the CB. CB is made in Sweden uh, by a company called Clean Motion. Clean Motion uh, got a um, World Health Organ uh, World 
Oh, some, some organization, some big organization, <laughs> they got a prize for it. Uh, and uh, the reason there was, it was basically t uh, done by designers who wanted to make the most efficient or very efficient uh, transport vehicle. So the whole vehicle just weighs 270 kilos, including batteries and, and, and motors and so forth, which gets it uh, to 40 watt hours per kilometer. Um, CT Cargo, CT Cube, adjust the dimensions. As you see, obviously the CT Cargo is a bit larger than the CT Cube. Um, I've got some specification sheets which you can take later on and if you have any questions, get back to me at some stage. Um, okay, so where, where are the target areas for the CT cargo? It's in mail and parcel deliveries and you probably know that Australia Post recently ordered a thousand three-wheel uh, electric vehicles from a Swiss company called Kibots. Um, and they, they actually, they are appearing in some suburbs. Yeah? Um, they look yeah, they're, they're, they're made for, for the post, and in New Zealand they have been used for quite some time. Um, I personally think they look a little bit like a, uh, a souped-up mobility scooter, yeah. uh, but they have their, they have their um, ways and, and also their advantages, particularly because they can go on the footpaths with that and can actually do the letter delivery still to the post box. Australia Post is very dedicated to um, to uh, actually getting rid of all the Hondas. And uh, basically that comes from the top down and is mostly driven by safety, um, but also by uh, a corporate responsibility in terms of sustainable, sustainable work. Right. Um, the other things too is obviously we can see them for supermarket deliveries. Supermarkets are, supermarkets are now looking at one hour delivery. And uh, we don't need a big diesel truck, you know, for, for individuals, you know, to get their weekly shopping home. In, in our vehicle here, we've got 1400 liters in space, or 1.4 cubic meters, and we can also get it refrigerated. The uh, CT Cube has two hub motors, which are a little bit more um, sippy, and with that, and, the, and their size, also makes it probably easier to do um, the filtering through the lanes. And with that, it's probably more targeted at larger sizes, but more time critical deliveries. Um, okay, let me go. There's just a little video showing you a little bit of the, the features. It's only gonna be a minute or so. But yeah, we have the front um, is articulated, and with the articulation, um, the vehicle drives more like a motorbike, and the back two wheels will actually stay on the ground. It's one of the things which is always said about the three wheelers in terms of their stability, uh, and that, it, that they will tip over. Uh, a nice feature, and I'm not sure if you've heard it, but we, we got three sounds of motorbikes which we can choose um, in the vehicles because in some European um, countries there it's required that they actually have a noise um, and we have got um, the noises from a two-stroke up to a 500 cc so we, we were thinking about having maybe a, an exhaust pipe and have some uh, soap bubbles coming out <laughs> you know just sort of to attract a little bit more attention So the, um, the CD Cargo and the CD Cube both are made by the same company in, in uh, China. And here we see the um, 18 degrees. The Chinese company is uh, very much, is, has a background from automotive industry and it's seen in a lot of the components which have been used. Um, now the uh, 18 degrees to either side, it, it provides a lot better riding and it brings a lot more safety to the, uh, to the cornering. Okay, um, as far as we know, it's the only motorcycle type vehicle which actually have a CAN bus. And a CAN bus is usually used in the automotive industry. It's the, that uh, computer system which uh, 
BMW or other manufacturers all have which have the diagnostics on them. And um, our vehicle has a CAN bus and can basically collect all these diagnostics and with a T-box, which is a telematics box, can then basically upload it to the cloud. Um, together with the GPS systems for fleet management, we know what the state of charge is, we know where the vehicle is, if you have been speeding when you shouldn't have been speeding. Uh, so it's Big Brother watching you. Um, one of the things we're looking for in terms of further developments, at the moment this has a fixed battery. It's a seven kilowatt hour battery. But uh, as we said before, uh, we see the only way forward is basically through battery swap. And with a seven kilowatt hour battery at about 55 kilos, uh, even that is still a little bit heavy. So the idea basically is to divide this up into several sections and we're thinking about three sections, uh, which then we're looking at about 15, kilowatt, uh, 15 kilogram uh, modules. Um, instead of actually discharging them in parallel, we would discharge, uh, the idea is to discharge them successively. And that means also when we have a round trip, which hasn't been fully exhausting, that you, can only, uh, that you only have to basically change one module uh, instead of the whole, the whole 60 kilos and then have to charge 30% of it or something like that, which makes it a little bit more uneconomical. Um, I previously said that we can put a solar panel on top. The box can be refrigerated. Uh, the solar panel will add probably about four to five kilometers per hour, but we, we see it actually more as a, as a add-on for a refrigerated system where it can actually do the refrigeration. Um, on the bottom here, you see um, the, the three steps. One of the things at the moment is actually that uh, couriers, um, 10 years ago, the courier companies, they didn't actually see e-commerce coming. And so they actually built a lot of their distribution centers at the city fringes. And uh, now, in areas like Sydney, for instance, it takes the driver one hour to get to the depot, one hour to get to where they deliver, and they do this twice a day, so four to five hours are basically stuck in traffic. Um, the problem now is that inner city distribution systems have been closed down so there's, and, and they have become very expensive. So the idea basically is to get the boxes pre-packaged and then delivered into the inner city and then have the vehicles like the city cargoes you know, and just exchange the boxes. Already pre-packaged according to the, to the route which is going to be taken, the driver would only go up scan it with a QR code or with an RFID tag, and it would load it to the GPS system, and off they go. Um, okay, the CB, the CB is our urban transport solution for the inner city taxi style service. You know, it's an interesting fact that since we have got this ride sharing, which uh, Uber or uh, um, Ola or all the, all the other uh, variations. It is quite interesting to note actually that the traffic in cities actually has increased to 60, 70 percent in some of the cities. And in the first instance that sounds sort of a little bit strange, but the other day I was listening to the radio and they were having an ad and it said, how long does it take you for an Uber to come to pick you up in the city at the moment? It's about three and a half minutes. Okay, three and a half minutes is not that long. So what are, that just means, you know, that there's many, many Uber drivers, and if they don't have a fare, what are they doing? You know, they're taking your car park until the car park inspector comes, drive off. Or they're ghosting and driving around until they get their fare. So, um, again, with, with right intentions, you know, but calling it a car share or a ride share, um, it's, it's not really what Uber is. Uber is a, a taxi service. Yeah. Anyway, so the, and, and the, the short trips, the, these short trips of one, two kilometers, um, they don't want to take you because there's not enough money for them. Right? So that's where we come in with these little, little pot taxi styles and uh, a company in Sweden called PSIT has uh, very, very uh, successfully implemented in Stockholm as well as in Göteborg. And the way it's done basically that they have a radius of about five kilometers from the city center and that within that radius, every trip is, is 
equivalent to about 10 bucks um, for, for two people. Um, short facts, you know, okay, so look, uh, again, we're looking for a battery swap. It has already been implemented at the moment. Um, we have got a four, four and a half, 4.8 kilowatt hour battery in this, which can be recharged in two and a half hours, but uh, it will be a battery swap, and the battery swap in these vehicles is actually one fixed battery and two exchangeable batteries. Uh, speed is maximum 50 kilometers hour. All our vehicles are actually at the moment classified as three-wheel mopeds, which can be driven in Queensland, Western Australia, South Australia, and the Northern Territory on a car license. In uh, New South Wales and Victoria, you have to have a motorbike license. Um, however, in New South Wales, in Victoria, this vehicle actually is classified as a three-wheel car, and you can car drive it with a car license, which, um, which is good in one sense, but the bad part is with 50 kilometers an hour, you don't want to take it on the freeway, which you could as a three-wheel car. So there's some pros and some cons. Um, that whole week, the, um, so what we're trying to target, and we, I said this before, is basically sort of energy efficiency, local emissions, but also congestion and limited car parking available and uh, uh, car park spaces. Um, so, look. <laughs> Almost, you know. <laughs> so, um, the other thing is obviously that the, uh, the whole design and, uh, initially was actually um, done to be as efficient as possible and we only have about 270 parts in the whole vehicle and that makes the servicing and, and also the repair costs obviously very cheap. Um, whereas a normal car has about 10 to 12,000. Um, operating cost, EV, you know, we don't have to really go into this. I guess you guys all know about that. Um, one of the things is I've done about 5,000 kilometers in one of the CBs around Brisbane and one of the major things is that everyone will turn their head for it. You know, everyone gives you the thumbs up. Everyone says, oh, that's the way to go and everything. So the advertising opportunity is, is quite large and as a business model, we could even go to a business model like maybe a Facebook model, you know, where the money doesn't actually come necessarily from the operating but from the advertising. Uh, and there are certainly opportunities also in business model development. So this is our latest venture and it's basically the electric mobility scooters. You know, where, um, the word scooters has uh, a few meanings, you know, and uh, I found that many people think when they think about an electric scooter, first about a, a, a disabled scooter. Uh, uh, also the wording of a personal mobility device, uh, which the, is the official wording, always is seen, you know, or oh, this is something for people who are, can't walk and so forth, but um, that's the way it was described in the, in the legal requirements. So we have got the iLark on top, which we got the vehicle here. We also will have um, two other vehicles, again, with the similar um, um, suspension, front suspension, two wheels in front. We're going to have what's called the iTango and the iTank, personal transport vehicle devices. Again, all of them are classified as three wheel mop uh, as, as mopeds because uh, the two wheels in front are less than 460 millimeters from center to center, and therefore we can classify it as a single wheel. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's it, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, when the, rules, when the rules are there, you know, you have to use them because they will use them against you. <laughs> um, so just to give you sort of an idea, yeah, so this is the iTango and um, it just shows you a little bit sort of about similar to the iLark, you know, the, the capabilities of the front. There's some driving here which is not recommended. No, it's not that. I think, yeah, sort of, look, you can do it, but same here, but, yeah. <laughs> okay, out of this, out of this, we are, we, are, we are now looking at another business model as well, which is um, scooter as a service, and with that, we're looking at um, making them available or trying to get them into apartment buildings, you know, as, as local 
local mobility devices, as well as maybe student accommodations uh, in resorts, um, as well as, as making it part of, of a corporate, of a corporate uh, mobility solution. Um, this was just one of the things, you know, you see all the green spots, they are actually free parking spots for, for motorbikes. Uh, the orange spots, they have to be paid, but most of them have a, a free period of, of at least one to two hours. Thank you very much. Graham. Yes, yes, the registration is that of a three wheel moped or a moped, and the registration per year is about $380. 380 yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Anyone else? So what's the, what's the range of this one? This one has a range uh, of about 85 kilometers. Did you notice there was no trailer tonight? You actually, Wolfgang actually drove this here? From Eight Mile Plains. <laughs> so, what are they worth to buy? Pardon me? What are they worth to buy? Okay, the, um, if you want to have a single one, you're looking at about $14,000. If you want to buy 10, or eight, no, eight, I think we get eight in a container, we certainly can come down quite drastically in price. Uh, so it's really a matter of, of uh, as a fleet sale, this is really where the fleet sales come in. For the other vehicles which we've seen, the, um, um, this one here is about $2,000. And the, uh, the, the, the other moped style, um, they will be under four, about there, yeah, about under four. Or near four, maybe over a little bit. Under five, okay. <laughs> Okay, this one here has a built-in built -in, uh, charger, yeah. and it's about a five-hour charge. Yeah. Is it kilowatt, do you know what kilowatt rate it is? Um, well, five hours charge, battery. it's a seven kilowatt hour battery, so it's about 1.5 kilowatt power. 1.2 kilowatt hour. 1.2. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But look, I mean, the, 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 the issue is rather, um, or, or what we really, looking for is to, to get the battery swap happening, yeah. you know, because then, yeah. We, had a, we, we recently had a meeting with, with Food Connect, which runs um, a, um, um, a local distribution from farmers and everything, and, and they have a very large, uh, it's, it's all community funded, but they have a very large uh, solar installation. And one of the things they were talking about with electric vehicles is basically that they actually do deliveries during the day, so <laughs> the only way they could make use of it, again, is, is to have separate batteries. Yeah. So with that in mind, you know, the battery swapping you know, will actually help in that sense that they will actually have for the next day um, and can go straight into, into, um, from the solar installation. When you pull those batteries out, Look, at the moment, at the moment, it doesn't have the battery swap. Yeah. You know, it will be the next thing, and will be modules, uh, which basically you can just extract. And similar to what I showed you here before, uh, go into a rack. Yeah. Yeah. Does that rack just have a plug-in port for 10 socket? Well, again, it depends. It will depend very much on, I guess, on, on what charge rates you want to have per, per battery. If you, if you have a large, if you have, yes. Yeah, 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 it, w it would be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I mean, we understand that. I mean, there has to be some, some infrastructure uh, or some, some installations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. As I said, at the moment, you know, there's a, there's a built-in charger. You know, if you have to refill it, you know, and that might be something, you know, which, which is still going to be there at, at a trickle charge yeah. type. Yeah. All right, round of applause for Wolfgang. I expect to see some of you on that as well.
tonight, just around here, do some small laps. Everyone seems to like jumping on a scooter at the end of the night, like why wait till the end of the night, just do it straight after this. Alright, thank you, uh, tea and coffee and chat time.